Hi, everybody. This is Ray from the Great Falls Public Library, and today is our fourth and final Zoo Montana animal encounter. So Katie and Brooke from Zoo Montana over in Billings are here to share some fantastic warm-blooded animal friends. Um, we are going to be meeting some birds and some mammals today. So take it away, Katie and Brooke. Awesome. Well, thank you. Once again, friends, my name is Katie and my lovely assistant, Brooke, and we are super excited to be showing you some birds and mammals today. Now, before we get started, just want to let, remind you that if you want to um, ask any questions during this program or have any observations, you can definitely put those in the chat and then Miss Ray will definitely be able to stop us and ask us those questions because we love to answer questions. Now, as she said earlier, today we are gonna be talking about birds and mammals. And one of those things that they do have in common is being warm-blooded. Now, if you got to watch any of the last few videos, you might know what cold-blooded and warm-blooded means, but we'll clarify that real quick. A warm-blooded animal, like us, the scientific word for warm-blooded is endothermic, or inside heat, meaning we create our heat inside our body. So your blood is always at about 98 degrees. Doesn't matter if it's 100 degrees outside or zero degrees outside. When you get cold, your body shivers to warm up your blood. And when you get hot, your body sweats to cool off your blood, to stay at that 98 degrees or so. Now, this is important because we use energy from our food to keep our blood at that temperature. Most other animals that are ectothermic, outside heat, they cannot create that heat inside their body and instead have to rely on the environment around them. Today, we're going to be meeting a few animals that are warm-blooded, and they can be found all over the world. Now, if you are ready, we're gonna talk about what makes an animal a mammal. Now, other than being warm-blooded, as we already discussed, mammals typically are defined by having hair. They are usually give birth to live young, and they typically feed those young with milk. That's one of the main, or those are the few main things that make an animal a mammal. There are always exceptions to the rule in biology. If you think of the egg-laying mammals like the platypus, there's always exceptions, but, they are generally considered to be mammals. Are you ready to meet our first mammal friend? All right, let's see who we have here today. So, with us here this afternoon, we have a very common type of rodent. Hi, would you like to come out? Good job. You have a treat? Yeah. This here is Sherman, and Sherman is a guinea pig. Now, guinea pigs are super common pets. Hi. And as pets, they can be found all over the world, wherever there's humans. And what I mean by pet is that they are fully domesticated. There aren't any guinea pigs in the wild. They have wild relatives, the ones that they were bred from, and those wild relatives are called cavies, C-A-V-V-I-E-S. And those cavies still exist in the wild. But several hundred years ago, humans brought some cavies into their houses and started breeding them for specific traits. So now that they are pets all over the world. Originally, those cavies are from South America, so that's where guinea pigs originated from. But despite that name of guinea pigs, they're not from the country of Guinea, and they're not pigs. They are related to rodents like rats and mice. They have the nice, sharp, long incisors, the teeth, the front teeth of those rodents, and they grow throughout their entire life. You might be able to tell, even from a distance, that her nose is twitching. That's because they have an excellent sense of smell. They also have good eyesight and good hearing. All of these things are really, were really helpful for their ancestors, the cavies, because they are a prey animal. They are herbivores, which means they eat plants, fruits, vegetables, nuts, those kinds of things. And that means that they are kind of low on the food chain and everything tries to eat them. So, they need good, all those good senses to help them to survive. Now, they also, one of the cool facts about them is they don't have a tail. They're one of the fewer, not the only mammals, but one of the fewer mammals that don't have a tail. And this is just something that has developed over time. Now, guinea pigs can be lots of different colors because humans have selectively bred them. And what another thing that also makes them a pet rather than a wild animal is that they rely on humans for their care and that humans breed them to be different colors, much like goats, horses, cows. Guinea pigs are a domesticated animal. 
Now we are going to do a nice close up with our camera here. So I'm going to have Brooke stand with our friend Sherman. We're going to do a nice close up here and you can see how cute she is. Look at those big, oh, she's interested <laughs> in the camera. <laughs> So you can see she's got big claws on the front. She only has three toes in the back. And those three toes in the back are actually very strong and connected to some very good muscles on her back legs. Another leftover of her ancestors, the cavies, because they can run really fast when they want to. Look at that little nose twitching. You'll also know that she has whiskers, just like a cat or a dog, and yet another way for her to sense her environment. Now, guinea pigs are pretty social animals, but they do have some pretty intense social dynamics to go with that. And what I mean by social dynamics is there's usually a hierarchy. Someone is in charge and others are not in charge. So here at the zoo, there are three guinea pigs that call the zoo home and they kind of take turns being the boss of the group. We have three guinea pigs, Sherman, Hank, and Coconut. And of those three, usually Sherman is the most chill and coconut is usually the boss most of the time, but they tell sometimes take turns being who, just um, figuring out who's in charge. Oh, cute. Just a little shake for us. Now, because again, that humans can breed them, guinea pigs can be all sorts of colors. They can be grays, mottled colors, tans, white, black, brown, any mixture of those. And there's also two different subbreeds. There's this normal short haired breed actually three, normal short haired breed. We have a long haired breed and there is a no haired breed. So they have quite a lot of variety in their genetics. Now I love their little floppy ears here. Hi. And their little mouths there are really cute too. Much like I said earlier, they do have those long front teeth. So one of the main parts of their diet is hay. And hay is quite coarse, but it's important to their diet because they have to use that hay to keep their teeth from being too long. So the hay helps keep their teeth worn down throughout their whole life. And she's got a little snack there that she's trying to debate on whether she wants to eat, but they are quite cute. There we go. <laughs> All right, Miss Ray, are there any questions about Sherman the guinea pig today? No questions so far, but boy, is he cute. <laughs> right? So guinea pigs, like I said, are very common pets, and they are also pretty smart animals. She has been trained to go into her crate, so when we're done here, we'll see if she wants to go back in there. And that's how she travels from her home to these programs. So they're pretty smart. They tend to live about five years or so with humans. Um, and that's just because rodents tend to live a pretty fast life. But they are very cute. They're social animals and they can be pretty awesome. As long as you know that you can give them the right amount of space and take care of them, they can be a pretty good pet. All right, friends. We will go ahead and see if Sherman is ready to go back inside her crate. You ready? There she goes. See? Smart. Here you go, Mrs. She's thinking about it. All right. All right, so we talked about a mammal that is a pet found all over the world, wherever there's humans, basically. And their ancestors are from South America. The animal we're about to meet today is a wild animal, or at least she, her species is still found in the wild and she is not domesticated species. And she's also from South America. We're going to be meeting Bandy. B-A-N-D-Y, and Bandy is a three-banded armadillo. Now, armadillos are found all throughout South America. There's actually about 19 different species, and only one species is here in North America, the nine-banded armadillo. Instead, the three-banded armadillo and the 18 other armadillo relatives live in South America in all sorts of habitats. Bandy herself lives in the grasslands south of the Amazon rainforest in countries like Brazil and Argentina. And as you can see, she's got lots of energy. And that's what this is all about. She is kind of like if you have a younger sibling who wakes up from their nap all full of energy, that's Bandy for you. Bandy here is a nocturnal animal. She spends most of her time out and about at night. So when we wake her up to come to these programs, she has a bunch of energy. Now you can see she's kind of sniffing around. We are also kind of using our hands to block her. That's not because we don't want her to walk around, but she has pretty poor eyesight. 
And with that poor eyesight, it makes it hard for her to tell how far she is from the edge of our desk here. Her desk is a couple of few feet off the ground, but we don't want her to fall. So we're making sure that she stays safe while she can explore this desk area. Now, you also might see some mess on the counter here. These are just wood shavings that are in her travel carrier to make it a nice little nest for her as she walks around and is transported around. Now, as a mammal, these armadillos tend to only have one or two babies at a time. Other armadillo species have more, some have less. She typically has one to two babies at a time and they're born about the size of a golf ball. They're born with that shell on their body already and it just hardens through their first couple of weeks and it grows with them just like your bones inside your body grow with you. Now we might have, if you watched any of our earlier videos, we did talk about a vertebrate versus an invertebrate. Invertebrates don't have a backbone. Vertebrates do. Mammals are considered vertebrates because we typically have a backbone in some way, shape, or form. So does Bandy. But unlike turtle friends, which we did talk about turtle friends, I believe, we talked about how turtles' shells are a part of their backbone. Armadillos are not. Their shell is just made of bony plates that are formed around her body and connected to the muscles and skin and tissues of her body. She still can't come out of her shell and she has a backbone that's part of her body, but that shell is uh, not connected to her backbone in the same way. She can still feel it when you scratch or when you touch her shell, but she is not connected to it like a turtle is. So it's an interesting way that two shells have developed. Fun fact, that type of thing where two different animals that are not closely related develop similar adaptations or tools for survival is called convergent evolution. Much like tigers and, excuse me, much like sharks and dolphins are both meant for the water, one is a fish, one is a mammal. They are very not closely related at all, but they have very similar adaptations for survival. That's what we were talking about here. Turtles and armadillos have obviously found that an armored way of life is very helpful for them, but they came about it in very different ways, which is kind of cool to think about and learn about. <laughs> As you can see here, she's a very curious animal. She's exploring, sniffing around. She has an excellent sense of smell and an excellent sense of hearing. I am going to bring that camera close to her so you can kind of see her head up close and personal. There we go. So as you can see, she's got those big ears that can fold next to her head. <laughs> Lots of energy, a hairy belly. She's got nice strong claws right here and a sniffy little nose that she uses to try to find things. And she's got armor on her tail and armor on her head. So all of these things are part of what make her so successful as an armadillo. <laughs> this animal is an insectivore, which means she eats bugs. She primarily eats things like ants and termites. She uses her sense of hearing and sense of smell to find them. And then she uses those nice big claws to dig up those ant termite mounts. This is really helpful for her because she also has a long sticky tongue to help her grab those animals. Now, fun fact, if that description, long sticky tongue, claws to help dig into ant termite mounts, triggered anything in your brain, you probably were thinking of ant eaters, and you wouldn't be wrong. <laughs> because ant eaters are a close relative of armadillos. Also, so are sloths. It's quite a crazy family that they've got going there. Anteaters, sloths, and armadillos are each other's closest relatives. So much like their anteater cousins, armadillos typically eat insects and they use nice long claws to dig into the ground to find them. Now you might be wondering, why does she have a hairy belly? Those little hairs on her belly are not particularly thick and they don't really help keep her warm. Plus she lives in a grassland. She doesn't need a lot of fur to keep her warm. Well, not only does the hair on her body help indicate to us that she's a mammal, but also that hair on her body is sensory. Much like the whiskers on a cat or a dog, she uses those hairs to sense her environment. You might notice where her head is at, it's hard for her to turn it to kind of look or smell below her. So these little hairs, if she's just walking along one day, can you move this way? And then something goes underneath her. Those little hairs tell her that something is there and she can back up and potentially eat a nice yummy, uh, ant or termite or something similar. Now, <laughs> one of my favorite things about armadillos is their teeth or their dentition. The way their teeth are arranged is really cool, similar to an anteater. They don't have teeth in the front of their mouth. And I'll show you what that looks like right here. This is a replica or plastic skull of a three-banded armadillo. 
It's got that bony plate that makes the top of her head. And then it shows you she doesn't have teeth in the front of her skull. I'll show you like this. She has just these bony plates right here. She doesn't have teeth until you get closer to the back of her mouth, which is something that's really interesting. All of their relatives have some pretty rare or weird teeth around them too. One of those other adaptations for survival is pretty unique to three-banded armadillos. If you've ever been to the southern United States, you might have seen the nine-banded armadillos. Called that because they have nine bands on their back. She has three bands on her back. The nine-banded armadillos are much larger, but they tend to also not have a similar adaptation for defense. Her adaptation for defense, the three-banded armadillo, is to roll herself up into a ball. She has armor on her tail, armor on her head. They fit together like puzzle pieces and completely protect her. Nine-banded armadillos are much too big for this, and they typically do a pancaking where they just lay flat, pulling their arms and legs, and hopefully their shell protects them. And every kind of armadillo does things differently. So they have quite a few different adaptations that help them to survive. Are there any questions or comments from our friends over on Facebook, Miss Ray? There aren't, which is kind of hard to believe, right? Because it's, it's such a um, such a fantastic and unexpected animal. So huh. you really don't have questions about the armadillo? <laughs> hmm, maybe later. That's okay. If you think of something later, definitely bring it up. If you've heard of something called a pangolin, which is a really cool, also armored mammal, pangolins and armadillos are not closely related. That ties back to that thing called convergent evolution. Convergent evolution, once again, is when two different animals that are not closely related figure out similar strategies for survival. So armadillos have armor on their body. So do pangolins. But pangolins are more closely related to the carnivores, cats, dogs, bears, weasels, than they are to the armadillos, who are more closely related to anteaters and sloths. So they have quite different lifestyles, but they have come across the same adaptation to help them survive. So let's go ahead and wave goodbye to Bandy. She's ready to go <laughs> back and nap. All right, friends. Now what we're going to do, I need to find my hand sanitizer. There we go. Okay, I'm going to clear off Bandy's wood chips. Here we go. And now we're going to be moving on to birds. Now, birds are warm-blooded like us, but they have a lot of, and actually we're going to land to the map just a little, okay? So birds have a lot of different characteristics than humans or other mammals, excuse me. Some of those include laying hard-shelled eggs, right? Every bird species that we know of so far lays hard-shelled eggs. This is a shell from an ostrich. And to show you the inside, look how thick that shell is. It's a hard shell. Unlike the soft shells of the reptiles and the amphibians that we talked about, these hard shells help protect the, well, I mean, all shells help protect the babies, but these hard shells kind of have a little bit of extra protection. So birds lay hard shelled eggs. Birds are warm blooded. Birds also have feathers. They're the only known living group that has feathers and their bones are almost hollow. If you were to open up your, well, not open up your bones, but if you were to look at the bones of a mammal, we have stuff filling all the parts of our bones because that's where a lot of important processes happen, including making blood cells and bone marrow. But birds are nearly hollow, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So this is a part of, this is a wing from a great horned owl. Now, don't worry, we didn't go out and just kill a great horned owl. This is one of those owls that was hit by a car and did not make it. So it was given to us if we could teach about it. But what I wanted to show you is not only the cool wing structure, but literally their bones are just up here in the top part of their wing. The rest of this is all feathers, okay? But the bone part is really cool. Okay, so let me see if I can show you. So do you see that inside structure? It kind of looks like toothpicks kind of inside of a straw. Those are called struts. And much like the struts in a building help hold the roof up, the struts inside a bird's bone help make them very strong while being extremely lightweight. And this is how most birds, though not all, can fly. A lot of us, when we think about birds, we think about one of those characteristics that defines them is that they can fly. But there are other animals that can fly and some birds that cannot. So flight is not the only thing that makes an animal a bird. 
but feathers and a lot of their bone structure does. I hope you thought that was kind of cool because we are going to meet a couple of cool birds on our own. And this little bird is an owl. Now owls are found all over the world in a lot of different habitats from the northern tundras in the, in the Arctic, all the way down to the rainforest in South America and in Africa. Now they are quite a diverse group of animals, but they're usually pretty identifiable because of a few main characteristics. One of those characteristics we're going to talk about is their face. But today you are going to be meeting Scout. And Scout is an Eastern screech owl. Fun fact, the only animal that you're meeting today that lives here in Montana in the wild. This here is Scout. I'm going to bring our camera nice and close for you to see him. There we go. Pardon our camera there. So as an Eastern screech owl, they tend to live from the eastern half of Montana almost all the way over to the east coast. They have a counterpart called the western screech owl that lives in western Montana to the west coast. And they both typically live in forested areas, although they can be fairly flexible. Now he looks pretty small and he is. Let me see if I can find our ruler. Is it down there? Yeah, cool. I want to make sure that he stays feeling comfortable, so I'm trying to give him some space. But as you can see with our ruler here, from tail to his head, he's only about eight inches tall. And that is an adult size for this type of bird. Scout here is at least seven or eight years old. In the wild, they tend to live about eight to 10 years, maybe, which means with us here at the zoo, he might live as long as 15 years. In the wild, the reason their lifespan is so short is, well, because they're small. They are a carnivore, much like most other owls, which means they eat other animals. But he is also small enough to be food for somebody else. So he's kind of middle of the food chain. Other owls, raccoons, foxes, basically anyone that can catch them unawares. Now you might also notice as he's looking at all of this that Scout only has one eye. And that is also the reason why he's with us. Scout was hit by a car several years ago. And when that happened, there was a lot of damage to his left eye, the one that's not there anymore. If you've been to the zoo before or have seen pictures of him before, he used to have both eyes except that one of them was all black and kind of speckly. And that's because that eye he couldn't see out of anymore. But over time, we noticed that that eye was not, uh, was probably starting to cause him some pain or discomfort. So he went into surgery with the local vets and they were able to remove it so that he was much more comfortable. And now he just has the one eye. But you might also notice, you know he was an owl just by looking at him. Again, I talked about that face earlier. And we're gonna talk about just why that face gives us the big clue. And that's because most of their senses are in that face and they're quite strong. All right, we're gonna move our camera back now. Make sure he has the space that he needs. All right. Hi buddy, I'm gonna switch spots with you so that he doesn't have me on his back. We wanna make sure that he feels comfortable. I'm gonna grab this over here. Perfect. Okay. Now, again, Scout is an Eastern screech owl. And we know he's an owl just because I told you the name, but also owls kind of have a pretty similar shape. They've got a pretty round kind of scooped out look to their face. They've got usually a shorter stockier body and they've got these feathers that often look like the bark of a tree. And that's because many, though not all, owls are nocturnal hunters that like to blend in during the day or camouflage. So Scout here, has a lot of amazing adaptations. And one of the things that makes him an owl is his excellent eyesight and excellent hearing. Now, if you make your hands how big an orange is, like maybe, like not a cutie orange, I mean a big orange, and I put that up to one of your eyes. If you were an owl, that's how big one of your eyes would be. And if we stretched him out to this, to our size, that's how big one of his eyes would be. Because just like large windows let in a lot of light to a room, large eyes let in a lot of light to an animal's brain and they're able to see really well. Now, many owls can see and hunt just by using starlight. No light pollution from cities, no moonlight. All they need is a little bit of starlight and they can hunt with that light. It's incredible. But even more amazing than their eyesight is their hearing. So again, I keep mentioning that scooped out look to their face. This little line, this little dark line here of feathers that surrounds his face makes up what's called the facial disc. The facial disc is seen on nearly every species of owls in some way, shape, or form, and it acts like their ear. Yeah, their face is basically a giant ear. 
It's kind of weird, but super cool at the same time. The reason it acts like that is because just like the shell of your ear helps you to gather sound. In fact, if you put your hand behind your ear like this and keep listening to my voice, it's going to sound a little bit louder, even though I'm not talking louder. And that's because your hand is helping the shell of your ear gather more sound. That's what the purpose is for the shape of his face. He has specialized feathers in that disc that help funnel sound to his ears, which, fun fact, are on the side of his head, like ours are. They're not these little tufts that stick up in the back. Those little tufts are part of his camouflage. So his ear holes are just in the side of his head, just like ours, and that's how he gathers sound. You might notice he's also moving his head around a lot. He has to do that for two different reasons. The first one being that with his eyes being so big in their skull, they can't hold their head still and move their eyes all around. We can do that, but they can't. So for them to turn their vision, they have to be able to do this. I'm moving my body, but he can move his neck a lot further. Also, they have excellent hearing, but if it's all facing one direction, it's harder for them to be able to scan things. So again, moving that neck means that they can hear in more variety of directions. However, Contrary to what the TV shows and cartoons have showed us, they cannot turn their heads all the way around, 360 degrees in a circle. If they could do that, their heads would just keep spinning and spinning, right? In reality, animals, nearly all animals, need blood supply to their brain, including owls. So instead, they can turn their heads about 375 degrees, or about three quarters of the way, or 275 degrees, which is three quarters of the way around. So if I had a neck like his, I could look this way, look back behind me, look over my shoulder at scalp without turning my head back around. That's how far they can turn in one direction. Often it looks like they're spinning in circles because they spin one way, spin the other, just really fast. So that's why they can look like they're spinning all the way around. They can do this because of the number of bones in their necks. So in your neck and in nearly every species of mammals, from a little bitty mouse all the way up to a giraffe, we have seven bones in our neck. That's about it, just seven. Birds vary a lot. Most birds have at least 10 to 12 bones in their neck, the highest being usually the swans, who usually have something like 21 or 24 different bones in their neck. The owls have 14, that's eight, 14 bones in their neck, friends. So with 14 bones in their neck, they have a lot more flexibility for them to be able to turn their head around. I could keep talking about owls for days, but let's grab a few different things to talk about before we let him go back. Now you might also notice that Miss Brooke is wearing a glove. It's not because it's cold down here or because she thought it would be fashionable. She's wearing that glove because he has talons. Many birds of prey or birds that use their feet and their beak to kill their prey, they are carnivores. They have impressive feet and talons. And that includes even this little guy that used to screech out. So on his little feet, he's got little feathers all the way down the tips of his toes. And then he's got long talons. And those talons are very strong. It's how he catches and kills most of his food with those feet and that beak. Now his mouth is larger than it looks, even though he just like looks like he has a tiny little beak, he does have a mouth that stretches all the way near next to his eyes. So he's got, he can swallow most of his food whole. Now a cool thing about being able to swallow their food whole is that unlike some animals or birds in particular, they cannot digest bone. So if you've ever had the chance to digest an owl pellet, it's super cool because you can find nearly the entire skeleton in that owl pellet. And we have a pellet to show you. But first, I think we'll say goodbye to Scott because he's getting a little bit uncomfortable. We want to make sure that he stays comfortable. All right. Add them. Aha. Okay. So this is one of Scout's pellets from February 2021, earlier this year. I'm gonna bring it nice and close to the camera for you to see. A pellet from a bird of prey is typically just this little cast looking thing. It's got a bunch of hair in it. It's got itty bitty little bones in it. And if you took it apart, you'd find most of the skeleton of what he was eating. So because they can't digest bone, they have to vomit it back up. And they usually vomit it back up with those indigestible materials like hair and other small bits of the body that they eat. Most of the time, Eastern screech owls are eating mice, but they also might occasionally eat small birds, small lizards, small snakes, depending on where they are living. Now, I know that was a lot of information all at once, but does anyone have any questions, Miss Ray?
Yes, we have. Well, we have a comment. Awesome. Um, so Jamie Marshall. So I'm wondering if maybe this is uh, her daughter, Marin, says my favorite bird is a harpy eagle. Oh my goodness. I love harpy eagles. They're one of my favorites too. Their feet are gigantic and they're one of the largest birds of prey in the whole world. They're super awesome. I love them too. Thanks for sharing that. Any other comments or questions, Ms. Ray? Um, nope, that's it. Um, but would you mind if I ask an owl question? Absolutely. I have heard that there are more species of owls in Montana than in any other state. Is that true? I actually don't know if that's true. Let me look because we have a lot of different habitats here in Montana. From the western half of the state, we have all those mountains and forests and river riparian areas. And then here on our eastern side of the state, we have grasslands and open more woodlands that transition to those grasslands and even desert-like areas. Um, so I would not be surprised if that was true, but I don't know, let me see. Looks like we have 15 owl species that live here, maybe more. I'm not seeing anything that says we have the most, but I bet we do have a lot because we also have some that migrate in and out of our state, including the snowy owls from the Arctic. They sometimes can be found in our state if it's nice and, uh, or if the weather changes weirdly for them. So the snowy owls can be here. We have the burrowing owls, which are one of the fewer nocturnal, or excuse me, diurnal or daytime owls. We do have a lot of variety here in Montana, but I don't know if we have the most. That's a good question. Though. All right, if that is all the questions and comments that we have right now, we do have one more animal friend to introduce to you. Do you want to try? Yep. Okay. All right. Now, our last guest for the day, our last animal teacher, is a very interesting bird that is from all the way in Australia. Now, even though they're not found here in the United States, except in zoos, they do have relatives that live here, right here in Montana, which are the kingfishers. With us, we're going to have the largest member of the kingfisher family, which is the laughing kookaburra. Now that's K-O-O-K-A-B-U-R-R-A. Kookaburras are very interesting birds. As the largest member of the kingfisher family, they are carnivorous, or they eat other animals. Hi, Sidbert. So this here is Sydney. And Sydney is a laughing kookaburra, like we said earlier. And I'm gonna turn our camera up there so that we can scoot you over to the edge. I'm gonna grow. Now that weird noise you hear me making is me trying to see if she wants to call to us because laughing kookaburras are known for their laugh. And laughing kookaburras use that laughing call as a tool for survival or an adaptation. Huh. We'll try a couple times during the program. Sometimes she calls and sometimes she doesn't. But, all right, let's see. She has some tail feathers here that she has broken, but she is growing out new ones. So she's in the process of getting new ones, which is something that they do every year or so. 
Now, laughing cucumbers, I mentioned, are carnivorous, which means they eat other animals. But being part of the Kingfisher family does not always mean that you're gonna eat fish. In fact, in Australia where they live, <laughs> In Australia, where they live, these birds eat mostly small lizards and small snakes. So in uh, here in Montana, we have little kingfishers that eat fish. She doesn't eat a lot of fish, except here at the zoo occasionally at the trees. But they, you might also notice her feet are very different from scouts in just that this brook is not wearing a glove. And that's because she does not have the sharp talons of a bird of prey. Again, humans like to put things in boxes, and the box that we put birds of prey into is they have sharp talons, they have strong curved beaks, and they usually eat, kill their food with their feet. Instead, she uses that big long beak. That big long beak helps her to um, grab her food, and then she does something pretty intense. So if she sees a snake on the ground or a small lizard, she will focus on it. And actually, if you can gently sway your hand, you can notice how her head might focus on something while her body moves underneath it. Maybe not right now. Oh, there you go, a little bit. Birds have the ability to hold their head still while the rest of their body moves underneath them. Because if you imagine, you're up in a branch, you're trying to focus on something on the ground and the branch is moving, our eyes are not good at tracking that kind of stuff. But her eyes, what she can do is keep an eye on that. Her head will hold still while the rest of her body moves and she can keep an eye on her prey. Anyway, she'll fly down to it and grab it with that really strong beak. Now, what she does usually is just shake it really hard and that usually breaks the neck of that animal immediately, and then they're dead. The next part that she does is pretty intense. It's called bashing. These animals will then take their food and snack it on the rocks or the branches nearby because it helps soften it, much like humans will soften steak to eat it, or you know, use that mallet to pound steak, makes it nice and tender. That's what she's doing with her food, except she's doing that because she needs to be able to swallow her food whole. She doesn't have teeth. No birds have teeth. That's another characteristic of birds. They don't have teeth, or at least living birds. All right, let's see if she'll call for us again. Maybe not. But the call that they do is has a multiple different functions. These birds are what we call semi-social, which means in some places they live in groups. And in some places, they don't. Often what determines that, determines that is resource availability. There's lots of food. They might live with lots of, you know, lots of other birds. There's not a lot. They're kind of singular on their own until it's time for baby season. But when they do live in groups, they use those calls to communicate in many different ways. A lot of the time here at the zoo, when people come up to Sydney's habitat, they'll call at her like I have been making this. Hi. When they make those calls, she calls back saying, hey, this is my territory, this is my space, stay away. Now, other calls can include warning about predators because even though she is a carnivore, she's in the middle of that food chain, which means that she has to look out for others like larger hawks, like dingoes, like even larger lizards like the guanas in Australia. So they have lots of calls. They have alarm calls, they have family calls, and they have territorial calls. They are nicknamed the Bushman's alarm clock in Australia because they have a tendency to do that social calling very early in the morning. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> All right, Miss Ray, are there any questions so far? Yes, Ella has a question. She's wondering if the kookaburra is on a leash. Yeah, excellent question, Ella. She is on a leash. And the reason for that is because Sydney is not injured, but nor is she from the wild. Sydney is from another zoo in the US. So she was born to be a teacher, right? Born to work to help others learn about her and her species in the wild. Now, as she was born a teacher, it means her wings are fine. She can fly and she has space to fly inside her habitat. However, here with us down here in our little studio, there's lots of wires. There's lots of places where she could fly and get hurt. So we have a leash, much like if you take a dog outside on the leash and a collar, except, oh yeah? <laughs> except that their necks are not as strong as a mammal's neck. So her leash is around her foot, and then we have, or her collar is basically around her foot, and then we have the leash to help hold on to her and keep her safe. She doesn't wear those all the time. They're just when she does programs to make sure that she stays safe. Great question, Ella. That was all the questions so far. No problem. We also wanted to show you 
her pellets because she also eats other animals. So she makes pellets too because her body can't digest the pellets. So I drop them on the ground. But these ones, it's a little easier, kind of girl, to see the bones inside this pellet. So you kind of see those little white bits inside of that. Those are bone remnants. Maybe. There we go. So that's really cool. If you ever find pellets and you're walking outside, you uh, might have found a place where those birds might nest. Not her, obviously, but things like other raptors, hawks, owls, and other raptors. All right, friends. I'm going to see if she'll call one more time. Oh, actually, I have another cool thing I can tell you about too. If that doesn't work, you ready? <laughs> sometimes she'll call. Do you mind if I take her? Yeah. Or sometimes she'll call. She steps up. Hi, you step up. <laughs> <laughs> Job it, bird. So that is why they're called laughing kookaburras. <laughs> um, and it's a very loud, raucous call, and it, it often means territorial. It can be communicating to social um, friends or people nearby. Huh? It's a good bird. She did really good. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that very loud call. I will go ahead and let you. Hello. Right. You step up. All right, we have a little bit more to talk about just because I heard one of your, you can go, okay, we'll say goodbye to Sydney. I heard one of the other projects you were doing for this was about peacocks. And I don't have a peacock to bring to you today. Our peacocks that live here at the zoo, they aren't program animals. They like to just wander and show off their big feathers. But speaking of their feathers, I did want to show you some feathers. Feathers are super cool structures. Most of the time they're meant for flying, but some of them are not. This here is obviously one of the very long display feathers. Now, male peacocks have long display feathers, a whole big train of them for a couple of different reasons. One is because they wanna show off to the girls. So they get a whole big train of feathers and then they bring it up like this and then they wiggle it. And they wiggle around, show off their wings and say, hey, I'm cool. And that's how they get their mates. They can also use it with predators, not to scare them off usually, but as a decoy. When a male peacock has their big long feathers and they're being chased by something, these feathers come out very easily. So if the predator pounces on this tail, the peacock can still keep running and get away. But peacocks also have other feathers, not just these gorgeous feathers right here with the blues and the greens and the iridescent changing colors. They also have red feathers and these spotted feathers. If you ever are here at the zoo and find a big long red feather or orangish feather, you have found one of the support feathers. And I don't have one with me right now, but the support feathers are very strong and go by their name, they support. They help prop up these tall feathers that they use to dance around with. They're a little bit longer than these and they're very strong and they sit at the base here and they're attached to muscles that can prop them up and help those feathers stand up so they can show off their gorgeous feathers. So peacocks can have all sorts of different colors, but the females, which are also called pea hens, just like the chicken, a hen, they are typically more this color. They've got spottiness to them or they're light brown or gray. They do have a little bit of those green iridescent bluish feathers on their head usually with a little bit of cool, cool feathers off the top of their head. But for the most part, they're a much lighter color. And this is also a tool for survival or an adaptation simply because they are trying to hide with their chicks and protect them. Males are bright colored and are not trying to hide. So they can have these bright feathers. And that's some of the cool feathers. I hope you have fun with your feather kit with the uh, peacock. And I also have you have fun with your guinea pig one as well. All right, Miss Ray, are there any other questions, comments? Anyone else wants to say anything before we head back and take our animal friends back to their houses?
Nope, I just hit refresh and we don't have any new um, any new questions or comments that came through. But I know that last week we talked about how if somebody gets in touch with me about a question about one of the Zoo Montana animals that I could send you an email and and you would oh, let us know. It's absolutely. Very cool I would you. love to answer that. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. All right, my friends, that is all we do have with us for today, but I encourage you to check out more of the summer reading program because Miss Ray and her team has put together so many cool things for you. You can also check out our YouTube channel because we have lots of videos about pretty much any of the animals that live here at the zoo, and you can learn even more that way. So I hope you have a great rest of your summer. Take care of yourselves in this heat, and I hope to see you again. Take care of yourselves and take care of each other, friends. Thank you so much, Katie, and thank you, Brooke. This has been awesome. Thank you for sharing your animals with us. Bye-bye. Bye, friends. Bye.